Hey there, folks, this is Seth Williams, and welcome to the RE Tipster Podcast. Today, I'm going to explore the fascinating world of cell phone towers and how we can find and capitalize on this unique opportunity as real estate investors. So in this episode, we're joined by a guy named Hugh Odom, who is the president of a company called Vertical Consultants, a firm that specializes in cell tower leases across the U.S. And with over a decade of experience as an attorney for AT&T, Hugh brings a wealth of insider knowledge to the table, sharing insights into the rapidly evolving cell tower industry and how property owners can benefit from it. So what you're listening to is a pre-recorded interview that I did with Hugh, and I hope you'll join us as we dive into this world of cell phone towers with one of the industry's leading experts. Let's dive in. Hey, Hugh, how's it going? Great, Seth. Thanks for having me today to talk to you. Why don't we just start out uh, by learning more about your background? So how did you get into this business exactly? Well, I was uh, originally a real estate and corporate attorney with a very large firm out in the West Coast. And about uh, five years into that, I got recruited by AT&T and headed up their real estate throughout the Western United States for almost 11 years. And kind of interesting fact there, AT&T at one point was the second largest holder of real estate in North America. They had more real estate holdings through ownership, leases, easements, et cetera. So there's a wide portfolio. So handled that for almost 11 years and then transitioned to forming my own company uh, back in 2010, uh, Vertical Consultants. And what we do is we help property owners in negotiations of cell tower leases, rooftop leases, et cetera, all across the country. Everybody from individual property owners all the way up to some of the largest corporations in North America. So we have a right, wide variety of clientele and it's been a interesting ride from being an attorney for all those years and then starting a company uh, almost 13 years ago and going from zero clients to now having clients all across the United States. Wow. I had no idea that AT&T was such a big player in real estate and that's mostly through easements and leases. That actually makes sense. I've got a property right now that has an AT&T lease going right through it. Is that pretty much like all of the roadside power poles and lines that you see going through there? Does AT&T have easements on that or leases on that? Or how does that work? Well, it's a variation. If you, if, if you think back years ago, when we had hardline phones. AT&T had all these hardline easements across the United States. So they had to connect everybody, correct? And so that's kind of transitioned over to fiber optics. Now it's leading up to the wireless tower sites, et cetera. They had all that through either easements or ground leases. Uh, and then they owned a lot of property as well. But it was amazing how much uh, real estate they had on their portfolio at that time. Wow. So the property that they own, is that just like for their office buildings or their towers or something? You're like, why would they need to own versus lease property? Or is it just whichever they can get to get the job done? Well, it was a transition. They, they made a little bit of a mistake years ago of owning a lot of small pieces of the property. And that became an issue when those properties became obsolete for the use. They owned a lot of buildings across the United States back again years ago because of call centers and just administrative, et cetera. Again, they're across the United States. So there's a lot of properties they own. That's transition. They've kind of got out of that a little bit to more leasing than owning because of the, the cost of ownership. Mm-hmm. Okay. So in your role now, it sounds like you uh, work directly with individual property owners to try to like find new opportunities to lease out land for a cell phone tower or to try to take existing leases and make them better or all the above or I would say there's four main components. We get contacted by literally two to 3000 people a month uh, looking to put something on their property. And we try to assist them to, I'll say, increase the odds somewhat. There's no way we can go out to an AT&T, Verizon or T-Mobile and say, Hey, this property's here. You need to put something on it. There's just no, that doesn't happen. The other other situation we work with, if somebody's been presented a new lease, let's say AT&T or Verizon comes to you and says, look, we want to lease your land. We want to put a cell tower on your property. We want to put equipment on your building rooftop. We assist in the valuation of that site, negotiation and structuring of that agreement from start to finish. If they have an existing cell tower on their property, we assist them with regards to understanding how to increase value on that by understanding, and we'll probably get this a little later, understanding the value of that one site and 
our average increase over the last several years has been 300 plus percent immediate increase in, in revenue these property owners have been able to get because again looking at it a little bit differently what different way the fourth final way property owners are sometimes contacted to sell those revenues so they're getting a monthly revenue and that's an opportunity we help with in the structuring of that agreement and valuation of that agreement and then sometimes kind of relate to that is certain groups come to us and say, hey, we want to start buying these leases because they see them as great passive revenue sources and great investments uh, for the long term. Yeah. Part of the reason why, uh, you know, when you reached out to me, your background intrigued me is because I know uh, as land investors and commercial real estate investors out there, you know, there is an opportunity from time to time to, you know, lease out a portion of the property to get lease revenue from a you know, phone company like this, or just some kind of lease revenue from a cell phone tower. And it sounds like from what you're saying, so if I have a property and I, there isn't currently one of those on it, but I want to get one on it, that doesn't really happen that often, right? It's more, you know, if the need is there, the cell phone company will contact the property owner. Is that, is that how it works? Or is there a way to make that happen if it doesn't already exist? Well, there's a slight way, and as I mentioned earlier, it's a way to increase the odds. Think of it like going to Las Vegas and you're trying to, you, the, the house has the better of the odds, and you're trying to make that margin just a little bit closer towards you. The best way to do that is for a cell tower company. The biggest issue they usually have is speed to market, and they need to find a property. So the best way you can kind of get a little bit closer to having a chance to get something on your on, on your land or your building is to get your information out to those companies looking and understand who to get those out to. So if they're looking in an area, let's say they're looking in Austin, Texas, for example, and in somewhere, if they already have information about one, the property's available, two, who owns the property, three, just general information of how to contact that person, that gets you so far ahead of the game right there because that, let's say again, Verizon is looking for something in that area. Well, they got to find out First, was their property available? Two, if the person's interested. And three, how to contact them. If you just get those three things to that company, that gets you, again, a little bit further down the road. But again, there's no way to contact Verizon or AT&T or any of the tower companies and say, hey, put something here because it's available. But one thing really quick, we're seeing more growth in the build out of cell sites than we've ever seen. And that's just based upon 5G technology because 5G works upon densification and you have to build more and more cell sites. So if you compare to last year, the year before, the year before, year four, there are more cell sites being built. As a result, more properties are being needed for those cell sites. And as a result, existing cell sites are more valuable than they ever have been because of the need for those cell sites to build up the network, more particularly 5G. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a couple of questions came up as you're talking there. So I guess, first of all, in terms of you know, letting it, the cell phone company know, you know, this property is available. Uh, here's how to get a hold of me. This kind of thing. Is this the kind of thing where like you just find out who they are and tell them once, or do you need to like remind them every six months? Hey, just so you know, this is free. I know like in uh, household sailing and looking for storage facilities, that's a very common thing where we'll like send direct mail again and again and again to one owner just to make sure we're still interested. Is that how this works or no? Like they just have a database and they put you in there and that's all you have to do. Well, I would say a couple of things. You need to get it. First of all, you need to get over the company, but you need to get over the right people in that company, number one. The second is, yes, you need to think of it like a bunch of paper on your desk. You need to move that paper back up to the top every so often. And not to advertise, but we provide a service that sends that out to almost 50 companies, and we repeat the process every three to six months. So the people who sign up for that service, they're getting that sent out to those companies. And again, also getting it kind of moved up to the top of the stack as, as much as we can. Now, again, there's no guarantee they'll get something on their property. We're just trying to increase those odds just a little bit for them. Yeah. So like, if somebody comes to you with a property where this is what they want, like what are some examples of property types that are ideal for this? Like the zoning, the size, location, features and characteristics. Like at what point would you look at one of these properties and just be like, no, don't even bother. This is never going to happen versus yeah, this should happen. Like we got to work on this. How do you make that decision and understand that? Well, I would tell you that the biggest issue is, and what's happening in the industry over the last several years is because of the growth of, of using cell phones for a lot of different ways, residential areas, you can't, if you have it on a residential property or if you own a multifamily property, that's kind of difficult because of the nature of the, the zoning there. The best properties, again, have kind of mixed use zoning and the best properties out there, I'll tell you, 
are churches, schools, municipal areas, and self-storage. Self-storage has some of the highest rates of having cell towers on them because of how self-storage facilities are, are determined. You go build a self-storage in a commercial area, but it's near residential, right? Because you need people to come drop off their stuff to store in the, in the facility. And those are in that little zone there that are best. So you're, if, you have a, if you're looking at a best property, you ask me, where are the best properties? You're going to look at a commercial area that is near residential areas because that's kind of that oasis zone. That's the same thing with churches. If churches are usually in the middle of a, of a community, right? A school in the middle of a community. The same thing with certain commercial properties. So if you understand, and this is one of the ways you need to understand how to negotiate these deals out, you need to understand the value of that one site and understand where their restrictions are, the cell tower company's restrictions are. But in general, if you have a property that is commercial but near residential, that has a higher value than others. Now, you can also look at certain situations where you have an agricultural piece of land that you may think, hey, this is out in the rural area. However, because of certain restrictions, because of how the network is laid out, it again has high value because of the nature of where they need to put the site. Just think of it this way. Every one of these sites has an individual value. Every one of these sites has a utility to the company leasing it. So you have to kind of deep dig into these things to understand what the value is. It's not based upon market comparisons or what somebody got in the road, et cetera. It's based upon that one valuation standpoint of that one particular site. That's how, and I'll tell you why I'm 100% correct on that. If you go in any city in the United States and you go to AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T has so many sites in a certain zip code, just a zip code, and you say to them, do all those sites have the same value to you? They would say no, because they all have their own individual value. So it's a property owner shouldn't look at it look at it a way of saying, hey, I'm going to judge these just because I'm in a certain geographic area. You have to look at them individually. Okay. Now, on that whole 5G thing, so... I'm definitely not an expert in this, but I have heard that these 5G towers or whatever you want to call them, are they smaller? Like, can they just go on a telephone pole instead of having its own dedicated, you know, conventional tower? Like, like when I think one of these cell phone towers, I'm thinking of something that's like, I don't know, five stories tall, this huge thing. Is that what we're talking about here? Or is there something different that we have in mind? It's a mixture of both. Think of it like a, a bicycle wheel. Okay. You have a hub and you have the spokes, Right. So if you have a macro site, which is a traditional cell tower, somebody's driving down the road, they see this huge cell tower. That's a macro site, let's just say for discussion purposes. All the smaller ones that you see sometimes as light poles, et cetera, those are smaller 5G sites that have to be very close to each other. So there's a combination of both. So what's happening is you're having a build out of those smaller sites in conjunction with larger sites being built out as well. So just to give you an example, Right now in the United States, there's approximately about 500,000 cell sites, okay? By 2030, some estimates, you will need another million on top. That means double of what you already have. So what does that translate to a property owner? That translates there's a lot more opportunity out there, whether you be an individual, a corporation, or a municipal organization. You're going to have to have these sites available because the only way this works, all the cell towers, all the cell sites, they're the backbone of all the information technology we have on our phone. And if we can't have that backbone, it's like having a, the fastest Ferrari, Lamborghini, et cetera, and there's no road, right? It doesn't do you much good. And so you have to build out that. So those small sites are going to be built, but there's going to be a whole bunch of large macro sites being built because they have to be the central hub uh, point as well. Yeah. And you may have already said this, but I guess just to confirm. So if we're talking about a residential property, like just a single family house, like this doesn't work there. Is that accurate or, or can it? Is there any condition in which you could do that? Sure. A single uh, family residential house, I will say it can happen. It's very limited at best. It depends on the area, et cetera. We're, we deal with sites like we're doing a few sites right now uh, in California and Florida, et cetera. They're an exception to it. They're kind of in a rural area, except for one up in Napa, California. It's right in the vineyards, but that's a different story. But those are ex- exceptions. Multifamily, like an apartment building, that's a possibility on the rooftop or in there. But a typical residential home, highly unlikely. Okay. I mean, do you think the day is coming where people won't have wireless routers in their houses anymore? They can just hook up to the local 5G and like, that's it? That's what they need for internet? Or is that a long, long ways off? No, it's literally right around the corner. I mean, you're going to you, just think you'll be unplugged. This is all being unplugged where you don't not into a, a typical hard line in the ground. 
what's called fixed wireless access, F FWA, is just basically what you're doing is when they build out 5G, you will not have a typical hard line into your house. You will be working off this at your home or office, even in a commercial setting, you'll be working off of a wireless connection that's not based upon a router. It's based upon that 5G network that you have in that area. So that, that day is somewhat already here. Uh, fixed wireless access is, is already available. It's just growing. And that's why there's such a build out as we we're talking about use of property. That's why they have to build out all these sites because to have that and have it at that speed, you have to have that densification. So it's, it's here. It's going to be a lot more here in the very near future. I'm not talking 10 years from now. I'm talking two or three years from now. We're going to see a total change in how everything is, how everything is set up from a commercial and a, a home application. Yeah. What do you know about Starlink and what are your thoughts about that? I don't know hardly anything about it, just other than what I hear on the street, which is not that credible. But, you know, the idea being there's satellites up in space that can give you Internet anywhere in the world. I don't know if that can control phones as well, but I don't know. Is that the future or is 5G the future? I think Starlink is one of the biggest, I think the biggest achievements that we're going to see in the next five to 10 years. I think Starlink and their competitors because Amazon Jeff Bezos and has his own company. Bill Gates has a company out there. So what basically Starlink is, is it's low orbit satellite telecommunications. And you're connecting not to a cell tower, you're connecting to a satellite. You can have that for internet service at your home, but also the transition is going to be you're connecting to that via your phone. And where that is right now and so advantageous, and T-Mobile is, is, has an agreement with Starlink to start in next year, how that's advantageous, if you think about it, if you're out in a remote area and you don't have a signal, well, think of the old movies or the movies still today. You have the sat phone, the satellite phone. And you're in the middle of the desert, and you have that sat phone, and they're calling each other. That gives you that availability to not only make a phone call, but text, et cetera. And if you're lost in an area, you don't have a service, that's great. Also, you know, if you've ever been in a, a bad weather situation where you had a hurricane or a tornado where the cell towers go down, it provides that backup service. Eventually, that will start to speed up, and you will have a situation by which we are using low orbit satellites just solely as well. Now that's, that's a ways away, but it is a transition. And there is, as I just mentioned, some of the players in it, they're spending billions upon billions of dollars. That is the next step in the telecom industry where there's a reliance upon that more than there is today. But you'll be hearing a lot more about Starlink and their competitors because that's really something that think of it, just think of it from this example. If you asked me 10 years ago or five years ago, Tesla, and you said, you know, where's Tesla there versus, you know, EV cars, where they are now and how much more integration. Just think about how we're transitioning. Same thing. It's just going to be a transition at some point. So I don't think we'll ever get off the cell tower situation, but it's going to be a transition. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Just, I mean, it's a different thing. But when I think about like the artificial intelligence space and how much has happened over the past six months, like just there, I mean... It's the kind of thing where I, I hear people predicting, yeah, imagine five years from now when this will be possible. But then that thing they say is possible, like literally the week later, like it's happening that quick where it's just like, whoa, this is unbelievable. Oh, one quick thing about artificial intelligence. The, the big thing with artificial intelligence, which is tied into all this, is artificial intelligence is incredible how quickly it's integrating into our world. But all this and again, I go back to the backbone of what we talked about of cell towers, OK? All this with regards to scalability, for artificial intelligence to get global and have scalability, it has to go wireless. It has to go over your phone. Think about if you can only use Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, on your laptop computer or at your home computer. You couldn't use it on your phone. Think about the scalability of users, that would be, how limited that would be. You're going to see once that transitions and once the 5G and Starlink and all these other things get the capability to tr transmit and have that capacity, it's just like lighting a match to gasoline. It will just explode. Yeah. Just makes me wonder, what is the future of having like the tower infrastructure all over the place if it's going to be beaming down from satellites? I don't know how long these leases typically are for a cell phone tower. Is it like 10, 20, 50 years? Like how long do they last? Sure. Well, to answer your first question regards to viability, I think I think the, the satellites are going to be an add-on, not a replacement anytime in the foreseeable future. I'm talking 20, 30, 40 years. I think there's going to be a, they're a great add-on. Okay. With regards to lease terms, that's a great question. A, a typical lease is somewhere between 20, 30 years up to sometimes 50, 60 years in length. Uh, that is both a benefit and a negative. 
because you, you need to understand that time is a commodity with these agreements. And if you understand how to negotiate these agreements out correctly, you understand how to give the right amount of time to secure the lease, but also not give up too much time so you don't have reentry points to renegotiate the lease. But they're great passive income sources long term, month after month, year after year. And if you negotiate them correctly and structure them correctly, you're going to see not only recurring revenue, you're going to see tremendous upside because as the value of those sites become more, you'll get pulled up as well if you structure them correctly. Now, the cell tower companies aren't going to give you that. They're going to make you work for it, but you can do it. Yeah. I mean, how much money does a typical cell tower lease make? And I know that's a super open-ended question, but like what determines this value or the price you can charge for it? Well, it kind of goes back to understanding where most people, when they're presented a cell tower lease. So if I came out to you today and you had a property and you're presented a cell tower lease, you would see an amount typically, and depending on if you're in a rural area versus an urban area, depending on what you are, somewhere between seven, eight hundred dollars a month to maybe a couple thousand dollars a month. Okay, with an escalator, let's say two or three percent, and let's just use a thirty-year term. The worst thing you can do from that perspective is look at, again, looking at what other people have been paid. You have to understand the value of that one site. Also, all an AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, or any cell tower company wants you to do is this, just this very basic thing. This is all they're trying to get you to do financially. Agree to that rent. Agree to that escalator. Agree to that term. Why? Because if I get you to agree to a 30-year lease of $2,000 a month and a 3% escalator, I have fixed my cost over that period of time. And no matter how much value I get as a cell tower company, I don't have to pay you anymore because I've fixed my cost. Now, just think of this way. I use this example for years. If I came out to you today, you had a piece of land. Let's say it's in the rural area. And I said to you, I'm not from a cell tower company, but I'm from Exxon. And I want to put a drill out here. And I'm going to use that area of your property. And I'm going to pay you $5,000 a month. And I'll increase it every year by 3%. Your first question, I bet, would be how much oil are you going to be getting, Right. You want to be paid not only based upon how much space they're using, but how much value they're deriving. But if you look at it as a utility, okay, so just if you close your eyes and you look at a cell tower, you look at a, a, an oil rig, they're very much the same. One is pulling value from the ground. One is pulling value from the sky. And the worst mistake property owners make is they think small. They think about rent, and they don't think about structure. If they understand that they need to be paid not only based upon the space being used, but the value being derived, you can have leases that are worth, over the value of the lease, a couple million dollars to $10, 15000000 million over the life of those leases. And if you go to sell those leases as well, that's understanding value and structure and not looking at it about what other people are getting paid. Because, of, because after the last 20, 30 years, the cell tower companies have had the advantage of getting really good deals. So if you look at those deals they've already gotten, you're just perpetuating the bad deals. Property owners contact us all the time. And they're not contacting us that have existing leases, as you say. They're not contacting us because they're happy. They're contacting because they understand they got kind of railroaded a little bit and they're undervalued. And the reason isn't just because they agreed to a lower rent than they should have. The reason is they didn't properly structure that lease. I mean, I can't tell you how much value is out there. The average lease, the average lease is undervalued between one to one point five million dollars. Wow. Just think about that. You have you have something that you have on your property that you've just undervalued just because you didn't understand how to structure correctly. Yeah. So if somebody already has an existing lease in place, is there any way to like go back to the negotiation table or is that is that ship already sailed? Yes, you do. You have it. There, we've we've been in business for 12 years and we've gone back with leases for 15, 20 years plus. Because here's the thing, as I mentioned at the start of the show, I was an attorney inside at t for a very long time. When you're trying to draft an agreement, if you're on the cell tower side, you're trying to draft an agreement that is going to be for 20, 30, 40 years, you can't throw a blanket over everything. There's things that are going to pop up that you don't, don't have under that agreement. And if you understand what they need and what they're lacking, that being the cell tower company, you can go in. If you understand the value of the site, you can go in. You always have an opportunity to, to either go in right now or have a strategy to go in when they contact you. But yes, definitely yes. It's one of the most misunderstood parts of a cell tower agreement. People say, well, I, I have 15 years left on the agreement. There's no way I can renegotiate. Definitely not. There's always a way to get back in it if you understand what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know you're an attorney. A lot of times when I think about calling attorneys, I'm just just knowing that it's going to be really expensive to do that. It's like, uh oh, I shouldn't even call because it's going to start costing me money. 
Do you have some kind of a free consultation where it's like, yeah, we'll take a look at it. If it's not going to work, we'll tell you that. We can go our separate ways. But if it is, we'll let you know. And how do you, how do you handle that kind of pricing? Sure. So I always tell people we get up, we, every day we give out more free advice than we get paid for. Um, we have a program. We've had it for the last 12 years. We give a free review of every lease out there, either if you've been presented a new lease or if you've been if you have an existing cell tower lease in your property. We sit down with people on the phone, discuss what their options are. And then we have different options with regards to how we charge our clients, either an hourly option, a contingency option or somewhere in between. And so definitely if somebody has a lease or been present one, we'll sit down with them and discuss it. And sometimes, you know, the best advice and, and this is the toughest thing to tell people is to do nothing. Sometimes they're trying to do something. They're so focused on somebody's offering them something and, and they're about to get into a bad deal. We'll be very bluntly honest. I am a bluntly honest person with them and say, here, here this is and what you should do. Because again, there's always opportunities, but there's always issues they need to understand as well. But to answer your question more directly, yes, we, we talk to people and, and discuss their situation. And if they'd like to use us for our, our services, then we present them a proposal for those services. Yeah. And just to confirm, in case anybody listening to this isn't putting this together, so having one of these leases on your property literally makes your property worth more, correct? If it's structured correctly, a, a tremendous amount more. If you can structure the lease correctly, it is one of the best real estate assets out there. Well, I mean, what I mean by that is you have a, an agreement by which it's totally passive. The cell tower company is paying you monthly, every month. If you structure correctly, you have no expenses with regards to taxes, utilities, maintenance, et cetera, for the area they're leasing. Zero. You're not having to do anything with that property. In addition, if you structure correctly, you're basically being pulled by a rocket. What I mean by that is the telecom industry, think about it. Besides air, water, and food, what do you rely upon mo more every day than your cell phone or wireless communication? You do, every day, somebody's using it. Is the most, it is growing at an exponential pace. You're in an area, an industry that is continuing to grow, can to get more and more value, and we're becoming more and more dependent upon it. And you're owning infrastructure. It is one of the best assets to own. What would you rather own, a car or the bridge the car goes over? That bridge is more important than the car. So my point being is it is a great value, again, with the caveat, if it's structured correctly. There's some negatives to it, but I'm sure we'll get into, but that it definitely increases value if you do it correctly. Yeah. Well, on that point, so who pays for this cell phone tower infrastructure? Like I assume the phone company does, right? So do they own the thing? Sure. So just a, a quick kind of breakdown of it. If a cell tower company comes to you, what they're doing is they're asking for the use of a particular area in your property. Let's say a, a couple thousand square feet. They are going to enter into a lease with you to lease that property for 20, 30 plus years. They are building out the infrastructure of the actual tower. They're building all the access roads. They're building all the uh, utility conduit, et cetera. None of that expense comes back onto the property owner. In addition, if the property owner's taxes go up based upon that tower being there, that should be passed back directly to the cell tower company. If there's utilities, that's paid directly from the utility company. If there's maintaining that road or that area they're leasing, that is paid directly by the cell tower company. That's why I say it's a it's true passive income if you understand to make sure you get those those things done correctly. So all that money that capital goes into it is from the cell tower company. All the expenses that go into it are passed back through or paid directly by the cell tower company. So as long as you get that structure correctly, I always say you're cashing checks. That's all you're doing. And those checks can get bigger and bigger if you understand how to capitalize on the upside potential of that cell tower as well. Yeah. So it sounds like this is like an absolute net lease, right? Where they basically the tenant pays for literally everything. Yes. This is why we have a couple thousand people at least per month contacting us about getting a cell tower on their property because they understand the value of it. They understand that even if it's on the, their land, their raw land, or on a rooftop, et cetera, commercial space or agricultural space, it is a revenue generator. It is a passive income generator. Cash flows, cash flows, cash flows. It's, again, not easy to get one, but one, if you can get one and do it correctly, it is a payoff for the property owner. Is there some kind of a way to see like a map of your area, maybe indicating, hey, there's a cell tower here and there and there. Just kind of understand, like, where's my property? Is there anything near it? What's the kind of potential? Like, should I be investigating this or not? Is there a way to do that? Or 
Sure. There's a couple ways. And uh, we have a huge database. We can see 90 plus percent of the all the properties out there with regards to cell towers actually on those sites. But a property owner, if they want to do this, I would say there's two ways, easy ways. There's a nice app called Open Signal, and you can download that, look at it, put in your address, and you see the cell towers around you. It provides you some information where everything is laid out. That's just a quick and easy. It's kind of the beginner level kind of situation, but you kind of see where everything is. Uh, the other thing, uh, we're located based in Nashville, Tennessee. The state of Tennessee and other states, they have records for assessments on real estate. And if a cell tower is on a piece of real estate, the assessor marks it and designates where that property is and, and the cell tower being there. You can go to your local assessor's website or office, pull that list, provides the addresses, provides the owner uh, information, and there you have it. Now, not every state has that, but you need to check your state and they may have it. You, um, um, for Tennessee, I'll let everybody know, in Tennessee, you can just go online. It's there. Awesome. Going back to this question of like what determines the value of one of these leases, so like, how do you figure that out? Is there a way to see how many uh, cell phone calls are going through the air in a certain area to understand, okay, that's what the demand is for this. So it's worth this. Like, is that how you do it? Or how do you determine that? That's a great question. The quick way of explaining that is two simple things. It's value derived and detriment avoided. And what I mean by that is if you have an existing lease or been presented a new lease, if you can understand and that's where you, you have to hire somebody like us to understand this to a great degree. But if you understand why that site is going to be built or why that site is already there, the value being derived, you could have a, a, a site in the middle of a rural area, a desolate area. And people say, well, that's, that has a lower worth. But if they only have that one option and that is key for that network in that area, the value goes up. You could have a site in the middle of here again. I'm in Nashville. In the middle of Nashville, that has a lower value because they have more options. Also, if they don't have the ability to build that out for their network, remember, they make money based upon serving their customers and the customers pay them. And if you understand what their detriment would be, if they couldn't get that site on your property, if they come to you for a new lease, or if they couldn't continue that site at your existing cell tower location, then you can understand how to get the value correctly. But once you get that value, if I said to you today, hey, uh, T-Mobile's come to you, they want to put a tower on your property. And I said to you, you know, we think the starting rent should be $1,875 a month. Great. You know what it's good for? That's good for today only. If you don't structure correctly and get paid based upon the value they're getting over time. So think about changing from 4G to 5G. When they're doing that, any cell tower company or more particularly any wireless carrier is upgrading so they can do two things. One, they can continue to serve their existing customers so those existing customers don't go to another carrier. Okay. Think about it. If you had AT&T and they only had 4G coverage and Verizon had 5G coverage, eventually you would swap over, right? Because you want the better service. So that's number one. So you want to retain existing customers. And the second thing is you want to have the ability to add more services on your subscription that you're currently getting for those customers so you can make more money. So understanding the different layers of this can help a property or not to get there right on day one, but to structure a lease. So every time they add value, Think about this. Every time that a cell tower company adds value, you want to get some of that additional value filtering down to you. That's just like my example, the oil example. If I'm sitting there and I tell you I'm going to get 1,000 barrels of oil from your property every month, and then I'm able to change that to 2,000 barrels of oil, I, as a property owner, I want to be paid on the 2,000 barrels, not the 1,000 barrels. So understand this is all about utility and structure. Mm -hmm. In terms of how these leases are structured, I know earlier we were talking about the future and Starlink and what that's going to look like and who knows. But let's say I create a 50-year lease with some cell phone company today. In 10 years from now, it turns out we don't need cell phone towers anymore. They're gone. I don't know if that'll happen, but who knows. Since that 50-year lease is in place and, you know, set amount of money and all this stuff, does that company have to keep paying me that lease payment even though they've shut the thing down and don't need it anymore? Or, or how does that work? Well, I'll give you two answers. One, usually they would not because they would just terminate their lease and walk away. They would take down their equipment, bring the property back to the original condition, et cetera. I don't believe that's going to happen anytime in the near future of mass exodus from cell towers. So usually they would not. Secondly, just again, self-promotion, if you, if you hired us, they would not because we ask for guarantees under agreements. So if something happens, they're continuing to pay you so they can't just walk away whenever. So there's a little bit of a caveat. The 90 plus percent of people out there that have cell tower leases, basically they have month to month agreements. 
we try to get our clients long-term guarantee agreements. That helps them two ways. They guarantee that payment, but think of it this way. If I came to you for valuation of a property, uh, let's say whatever your property may be, and I said, I have a lease here that has a 15-year guarantee of revenue, uh, and I'm getting $2,000 a month, versus I have a lease here that can be canceled at any time, that's getting $2,000 a month, which is a more valuable asset for that property. So it's all about structuring. I keep on saying that, but the one thing, one of the words we key word to talk to people about is structure, structure, structure. The reason being is, very quickly, is a cell tower company, a wireless carrier, when they present anything to a property owner, I don't care if one of the biggest companies in the world or individual property owner, they try to get them to think very small. We try to get our property owners to think bigger because that structure and thinking bigger will pay off over the long term. And that's why we're in business 12 years later. We have proven the model over and over is a situation by which we are trying to change the way people think because the cell tower companies and wireless carriers try to get them to think very small. And when they do that, the property owner miss out on a lot of opportunity and a lot of value. Yeah. So do these cell phone companies like hate you because of... Uh... Are you, are you costing more money? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hate such a nasty word. I would <laughs> say that they do not like us and more particularly me because we, we're very honest with people and we're very honest with them. And we hold them, that being the cell tower companies, wire carriers, we just tell them straight forth how it needs to be. And we know, look, the great thing about the cell tower industry and the bad thing about the cell tower industry is the exact same thing. It's been done the same way for the last 20, 30 years. So I, I know the playbook. It's like lining up in football and you know what the play is going to be already. I know what their next play is going to be. I know what their next play is going to be. And if you understand that, they hate that because the big thing in the industry is they don't want anybody to know what's behind the curtain. Hold on. You don't need to know that. You know, we don't want to tell you how much value the site is actually giving to us. We don't want to let you know how bad it would be if we couldn't have the site. If you know that, and you understand what their next move is or could possibly be, yes, they do not like it. Yeah. I got to think almost nobody understands how that works behind the scenes, right? I mean, it's such a specialized thing. Like, I don't know how they would know it if they weren't working with you, right? Yeah, it is. It is a huge industry with a niche kind of group of people who understand it. Sometimes we we have people contact us and say, well, I, you know, I had my local attorney do this or I had this. And I say, well, that's great. And they're probably a whole lot smarter than I am. But they're not smarter than us about this one thing. This is what we do over and over. It's like, like going to a doctor and to a, you know, a dentist and you're about to have heart surgery. It, you know, the dentist is a doctor, but he doesn't do this every day. He doesn't perform heart surgery. And it really is that specialized. And that, again, is what the cell tower companies rely upon. They understand they're trying to do two basic things when they approach a property owner. They're trying to take things from that property owner and they don't realize they're being taken. And they're trying to give things to the property owner and they're really not what they seem to be. Simple as that. It gets, I mean, this is, this is not rocket science, it is, but it is a very, if you understand those key components, you can do it over and over, but you have to understand those and understand, again, that to a particular detail. Yeah. Well, I know as real estate investors, Something that a lot of us are specialists in because we have to be in order to find great real estate deals is understanding where and how to find lists of very specific types of properties and property owners, properties with certain characteristics and locations and values and all this stuff. So if my goal was to find a property with a cell phone tower on it to buy that source of income, can you think of anything that uh, we would need to search for to narrow down those specific types of properties? Or is there no way to do that? I, I don't know if there's any database out there that lists, here's where all the cell phone towers are and these properties. I mean, obviously it's got to be, it sounds like commercial, that kind of thing, maybe multifamily, but is there any other characteristics to look for? Or? Well, I don't think it's so much characteristics. If you want today, it's kind of like what we go back to earlier. If you want today and you said, look, I want to go try to buy 10 cell tower lease agreements, okay, for the revenue. I would say easily go online. There's different, different applications that you can go. Let's say again, I'm here in Nashville. I can go in Nashville and I can pick, I can see where all the cell towers are, right? I can see the addresses of those locations. I just look in, up, up in my local county assessor's office who owns it, right? Simple as that. That's the step one. Some counties, some states even have roles of all the cell towers that are being assessed. The real property owners being assessed and Here's your list. Here's all the locations. Here's the information to that property owner. You just reach out to them. The other way, very simply, 
when you drive home today, you'll see cell towers everywhere. And you just locate the site and you write down the address and, and, there, and there you go. And that's the, that's the old school quick way. And you go up and either knock on the door or you write down the address and find who lives there and contact them. Is there a way to buy just the lease from them instead of buying the whole property? Like, is that something people do? Yes. Okay. Yes, definitely. It's a huge industry out there. Property owners are contacted all the time. And it is a great industry if you understand how to value the lease correctly. It is, as I said, it's a, it's a passive income source with continued growth. So you can go out and one of the growing industries out there, we get contact all the time by people saying, look, I want to go and invest in buying these leases. Think of it like buying an annuity to some degree. And they're going out and buying the cash flows. So again, that's kind of what we're just talking about is that you can, if you find a list of property owners, you contact them and say, look, I'm willing to buy this at a certain price based upon future revenues. Now, the tricky part of that is, again, understand the value of that particular site because every dollar isn't the same based upon the value of the lease, who's on the tower, et cetera. But it is a huge growing industry. And I can't tell you over the last five years how many more people are getting into it because of the uptick value of these things. And in addition to that, what we see all the time is just, I think in the last couple of weeks, we saw two or three examples where a property owner has gone in, bought a property, the overall property, but they bought the lease with it, of course, and they've gone in and resold the lease for three or four times the value of what they paid for it because they understand the value of the lease. And so it, if you buy the property, understand the value of the lease, but you can go buy the lease separately if you want to. So maybe one angle a person could take is try to go seek out these leases, buy them, then work with you to make them worth more, maybe increase the payment or something, make it more valuable and then sell it. Or maybe just buy it cheaper and then hang on to it and make, is that, Sound like a thing somebody could do? Yeah, it, it, either way. I mean, it's a great source of revenue. We can uptick it. That's one of the things. We go in and increase value immediately. But the other thing here is if you think about think of it from this perspective, I go buy something and I'm getting a cash flow of, let's say, $30,000 a year, and I have a 3% escalator, and I have an asset based upon that. I'll tell you just quickly, that asset would be somewhere in the six hundred dollars to $700,000 range. Okay, if you just bought it, it's thirty thousand dollars a year, just kind of a bland. I'm getting, let's say, six hundred thousand dollar valuation. I got a three percent escalator. It's increasing in value by three percent every year. I'm getting paid a dividend, my rent of thirty thousand dollars, which is increasing as well. Just think about, and it's no cost to me, zero. I have nothing. If you go buy an apartment building, you go buy a piece of land, you go buy anything. That is not true passive income because you have time involved in it. You have maintenance. You have everything associated. You have landlord issues, et cetera. This is not. This is why people are out there scouring to get these things out there. It's becoming a bigger industry because of two things. People are learning about it, but more and more cell towers are getting built. The ones that are out there are getting more valuable because of the dependency upon them. And there's more opportunity as well. Yeah. Interesting. Buying cell phone tower leases, it almost kind of reminds me of buying a note or something, like a source of income that's going to go in the future, and you're just basically cashing that person out now. Is that, like, why would a person sell a lease like this? Just because they want more money now? Yes. There's three reasons people sell their leases. One, they need the money, of course. Two, they have a better use. They think they can take that and move it towards something else and whatever. And that can be just taking the money, reinvesting somewhere. We see a lot of property owners do it and say capital investment in their existing property. They're going to redevelop their property, et cetera. And it's quick money to get that. And the third is hedge. You're hedging against that long-term viability of the site. And again, depending on the site, that's either a good move or bad move. Usually it's not the best move, but again, you have the ability to go buy these things if you want to. And if you understand what you're looking at, you can make a, a good amount of money off of them. Yeah. So when you mentioned this uh, website or whatever it is in Tennessee or Nashville, where you can find all these locations and addresses of all the cell phone properties. So if I wanted to see if I could find something like that in my state or just any state out there, what would a person do a Google search for to try to see if that's available? Like any keywords come to mind in terms of how you would find that? I would suggest three things. One, first, I would look at your local property assessors, county or state, local property assessors, and then just there should be some designation with regards to cell towers, okay? Like in the state of Tennessee, there is. Secondly, pick up the phone. Call the state assessor or the local assessor in your county and say, look, do you guys have a list or you designate on your website or otherwise where the cell towers are assessed? And there's more and more of them being assessed every year because 
the counties and states are understanding there's revenue available for them to assess these properties with that on there and for the cell tower companies. The third is, as I mentioned before, there's a great app called Open Signal, and you can go in there, put in your address. It'll show you all the, all the cell sites around you. You click on it, you find the address, you go on the assessor's office, et cetera. There's some back ways you can do this. Or as I mentioned before, you just drive down the street and you, you find one, you say, hey, that's, hey, I can write down some addresses. I mean, they're everywhere. The funny thing we always run into is people say, I didn't really know cell towers until I got approached for a cell tower or I heard about this. And then they start looking everywhere and they're, they're all over their town or their city. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. But the assessor's office is kind of the back channel way to do it. And once you have that list, it is just all you got to do is you know, start contacting those people. And it's, you can do that direct mail. You can do that via phone, emails, et cetera. You can get the information. Yeah, I just did a Google search right now for my county where I live. Kent County cell phone tower map locations. I think it was the second second result that showed me FCC registered antenna towers in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And there's literal coordinates for every single one that there is. So it's not that hard, apparently. Just got to try a little bit and you'll find them. No, it's not. It's, it is growing. And so people understand uh, and we promote it to understand people for real estate investors, especially the valuation of these and also the opportunity as well. Yeah. Out of curiosity. So how do you make your money? Do I need to write you a check or do you like take a portion of the lease revenue in the future or like what's in it for you to do all this? Well, we make our money. We work very hard. <laughs> We're very good at what we do. But we either work on a strictly hourly basis, depending on the situation. Or we work on a basis by which if we're able to add a dollar for you, we get a percentage of that dollar. Or we work on a one-time fee basis as well. So uh, as I said, we have a wide variety of clientele. So we, have one of the, we, have, we do work for one of the largest retailers in North America. We have some of the largest self-storage companies, et cetera. So their deals are different from an individual. So, but we always sit down with property owners. And just like I say that we try to tell property owners you need to look at each situation individually for the valuation, we look at it as well. And then we come up with a proposal for them. You know, I, I would say if I had to come out and paint your office building, uh, I'd want to look at it first, right? And then I'll give you a quote based upon the situation. But we have a wide variety. And as I've mentioned a few times here, we've been doing this for 12 years, almost 13. My advice to anybody, we're not the right fit for everybody. I am, as again, brutally honest with everybody. We're not the right fit for everybody. And hopefully we are. We know everybody who comes to us, we want to help them. But even if we're not the right fit for you, Get someone to assist you with this. The one thing that the cell tower companies rely upon is the belief of property owners that they understand how to do these things. And I can tell you that from being on the other side for over a decade. And some of the smartest people on the other side of the table when I was negotiating deals for AT&T were so much smarter than I was, but they, they didn't understand how to structure these agreements. And my company at that time, AT&T, benefited greatly from it. Yeah. The reason I asked that is just because I'm trying to think through the rationale why somebody wouldn't pick up the phone and call you. And in my mind, one of the reasons would be, I don't want to like rack up a huge bill with this company and then they can't actually do anything. Like, I, I don't want to get stuck into that situation. Does that ever happen where it's like you go to work and spend tons of hours on stuff and you're like, oh, sorry, we can't do anything. Pay up. Like, is that a common scenario or is there some way that people can feel safe knowing it's going to be fine? If this doesn't go anywhere, I'm not going to be stuck with a huge bill. How, how does that work? Sure. So I'll give you the, the best answer I can. The vast majority of our clients, are our work is based strictly upon performance. So we don't get paid unless we get benefit for them. And when I say benefit, it's not just benefit financially. It's also non-monetarily of how to protect them as well. That's the vast majority. Some clients, we're on an hourly basis, but we cap those hours so we don't have a runaway train on this. And we're always very upfront with property owners about that and saying, here's how long it's going to take to do this and then how it's going to progress from there. So it's a transaction. Again, I'm brutally honest. It's a transaction. It always has possibilities of going sideways or falling apart. I can't control that. We can't control that. But we're very upfront about what the situation is, what the possibilities are, what the risks are, what the opportunities are. And again, the vast majority of our clients and the vast majority of our fees are based upon results, not based upon us working really hard. It's based upon us actually getting a result. My dad used to say, uh, effort is great. Results are better. And so that's, you know, everybody wants a result and we're happy to do it. And we'll put our track record against anybody out there on the ability to get results, real results. Sure. And this, uh, I don't know if you'll have any input on this part, but are there any downsides to having a cell tower on your property? Like, is it ever a pain or a hassle or 
when you think of any negatives, I mean, obviously there's a huge positive with the, the revenue from it, but um, I don't know, any reason why a person wouldn't want that? Yes. And there's very, and there's one big glaring reason that you have to understand how to structure. Again, I go back to the word structure, the lease correctly. The misnomer, the misunderstanding out there when you're leasing space for a cell tower, whether it be on your rooftop or on, the, on raw land, is you're leasing a certain amount of space, right? I'm leasing 1,000 square feet, 2,000 square feet, 3,000 square feet. That's correct. But you're also putting restrictions on the rest of your property if you don't understand how to structure. So a, a cell tower company will say, we're going to have the right to use this property over here for 30 years. However, if you don't understand how that lease is structured, they can restrict what you can do on the rest of the property. And how that comes into play, especially for commercial properties or even agricultural properties that get reconverted to commercial down the road, is that that limits future development, that limits uh, future disposition, that limits sometimes future financing of the property. So you have to understand they're not just leasing those areas described. They're sometimes putting restrictions. So you have to limit those restrictions. You also think of it this way. I always use this example. If there's a cell tower on a property and the typical cell tower lease says, look, I have the right to use this 2,000 square foot area of your property. And let's say you sign the lease, goes on for 10 years, and then somebody comes in and offers you 10 times market value of your property with one condition. They're okay with the cell tower. They just need the cell tower company to reroute the utilities to the cell tower because the way they're going to develop the property. 90 Five plus percent of all cell tower leases have no relocation rights for the property owner. I cannot tell you how many times we've been contacted, especially commercial property owners, and say, look, we want to redevelop. We want to sell our property. They're asking us to do this. And they haven't put in a pathway to deal with those situations. All these leases are is about structuring to get you opportunities and pathways to deal with situations. Again, going back to what I said previously, people start thinking very small. They think about the rent. You have to think bigger and property owners say, well, I'm never going to do this. never going to happen. They start to think about what's right in front of them and not the possibilities over a long-term agreement. So the biggest issue and the way you can devalue your property, if you don't do this correctly, is you can give the, the cell tower company somewhat control of the rest of your property. And that becomes an issue. And it may not be an issue today. It may not be an issue two years from now, but it could be an issue. And I always tell people, I use the example of my dad and I used to go hiking all the time, but he carried, he carried, always carried a compass, always carried a compass. And he told me when I was very young, he said, I know where we're going. We've been here a hundred times, but I always want to make sure I have a pathway to get out, a map and a compass. And that's what you have to do in these leases. So that's the biggest issue. That's how you can hurt yourself the most. You also have some liability issues you need to contain insurance issues, et cetera. But those are fixes. If you understand what you're doing, you can do very well, but control your property is the biggest issue that you can run into. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see that. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of my own self-storage property. I can visualize a spot on it where a cell phone tower could totally go, which is fine for today. But I think look at 10 or 20 years into the future. What if we want to like make it not a self-storage facility anymore and build like a strip mall there or some kind of a, I don't know, box store or something in that cell phone tower is in the way. Like, are there ways to put uh, lease provisions in there? So it's like, hey, if that ever happens, we can knock that thing down or re relocate it somewhere else on the property on top of the building after it's done or something like that. Sure. There's two basic ways of doing that. One is, I just mentioned, you have relocation rights based upon the ability to relocate them to another portion of your property. The other is a redevelopment right. So you have a termination right at a certain point in time in the lease. If you want to redevelop the property, you basically push that button. You say, I'm giving you this much notice. We just need you out of here. And so that, again, needs to be understood by the property owner, needs to be negotiated and structured by the property owner. But again, 95 plus percent of all cell tower leases don't have those two basic rights into the in those leases. And what happens is the property owner kind of gets stuck. Think about it. You have a situation by a small portion of property. You're revolving around them. You're subordinate to what they want you to do. That is the biggest downfall. That is the biggest trap door for these leases. And people may say, well, that's not going to happen. All it has to happen is once. <laughs> and it becomes a huge issue for you. Well, Hugh, I appreciate uh, your time talking to me today. If people want to find out more about you, uh, give you a call, figure out what's possible. What's the best way to do that? The best way to reach out to us, go to our website, which is celltowerleaseexperts.com. You can also go to our YouTube channel, which is just Vertical Consultants at Vertical Consultants. And we're happy to give you more information about what we do and answer your questions. Again, we can provide a free review of any new lease you've been presented, any existing lease. If you have questions about getting something on your property, we're happy to discuss that as well. Great. 
And uh, this is episode 155. So I'm going to have links to uh, Hugh's website and a lot of other stuff that we talked about here at retipster.com forward slash 155. And you can check out that stuff there as well. Hugh, again, thanks for coming on. It's great to talk to you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity.